But first, to two big contests about to begin. The largest prize, the winner-take-all state of Arizona. 58 delegates at stake there. The latest polling shows it's Donald Trump's race to lose. He has received the backing of several prominent state leaders, like Sheriff Joe Arpaio and former Arizona Governor Jan Brewer. Then there's Utah. The math will be a little more complicated there. 40 delegates are at play, and if one candidate wins the caucuses by more than 50 percent, then Utah is winner-take-all. If not, the delegates will be awarded on a proportional basis. Right now, the latest poll shows Senator Ted Cruz in the lead there. He's won support in Utah from 2012 Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney. Chris Dyerwalt is our Fox News digital politics editor, and he's here to tell us what to expect. Chris, good to see you. So good to see you. The conventional wisdom is that Arizona is going to go to Trump. Utah will go to Ted Cruz. What, what's your thinking on it? Uh, conventional wisdom ought to be very right. Uh, there are hardly two states that should stack up better for these two candidates as we headed to the home stretch. And by the way, who would have thought that we would get to continue to cover elections at this point in March in 2016? You know so. what? I'll tell you what, you raise a good point because I scheduled a vacation with my little ones down in Florida for this week. They're, they're on spring break. And then I found out we have election coverage. So I said, what are you? Well, I'm not going. So Brett's going to have to do it by himself. Well, I'll, I'll be there with him, and I will not be, the, the viewers will not be as happy that I will be there, but uh, that's, we're just <laughs> going to do the, the best we can Tuesday, in your but absence. I, I got to go to Disney, Stierwell. Better you than me. I would, I, would, I would cover 50 elections before I would do that, so then we, then we <laughs> okay, are cool. But we digress. Quite. Uh, the answer is this. If you look for a state that matches Donald Trump's voter profile, the demographic profile for Donald Trump, Arizona is the one. Uh, obviously, the big issue in Arizona has been immigration. You have a state that has been rocked, roiled, and really hurt by illegal immigration and has shown that there is a federal and state level incapacity for dealing even with legal immigration. On top of that, you have a state that is uh, not the top when it comes to education, not the top when it comes to workforce, not the top in a lot of ways. It has economically struggled and has struggled with immigration. This is Trump country. Mm -hmm. But then you flip over to Utah. This is a state that is doing really well. Utah is the youngest state, demographically speaking. Uh, it is a state with uh, very low unemployment. This is a state that is economically succeeding. This is a state that is doing very well. This is the kind of state where Donald Trump doesn't do well. You don't have the overlay of ethnic tension. You don't have that same overlay. The two states are right next to each other. Utah is also, by the way, the most church-going state in the union. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the so, most conservative state in the union. So, but what so is that should be very good us? for Ted what is this? I mean, it, let's say they split the result as expected tomorrow. Where are we in the race? What does that change? Well, we have, to, we have to put one caveat on. If John Kasich denies Ted Cruz an outright full majority win in Utah, uh, he can expect to have uh, a lot of raspberries blown in his direction by the Republican Party. Because if the function of John Kasich being in this race is to deny Ted Cruz the opportunity to fight Donald Trump to the end, there will be very little patience. And the patience for Kasich is already getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But if Kasich denies, if he is in there for 5% or 6% in Utah and denies Cruz the chance to defeat Trump outright and win all those delegates and keep this thing rolling on, if that's John Kasich's role in this race, he is going to be Dr. Stinkberger in the minds of many, many, many Republicans. But not even the Trump people supporters. Well, no, of course, for Trump supporters, they want Kasich to divide that vote, have that result in Utah be split so that it's not a split decision tomorrow, but instead that Trump gets closer and closer to the point. But one thing I will say, and I think this is important to point out, uh, when we look at the polling in Utah, and this includes the latest one uh, that we saw out today, yes, Ted Cruz is ahead, but you know what else the poll showed? Mm -hmm. That the state becomes a swing state in the general election because Donald Trump is that unpopular in Utah. So the map is being redrawn. I'm just I'm kind of stuck on you saying that they're going to they're going to blow a bunch of raspberries at John Kasich. I mean, isn't the raspberry where like you kiss your baby's belly and you make that sound? And that's the thought a of the Republicans Everybody doing knows that that's to a John Kasich, like I, I couldn't get past it. I don't, I don't crazy see talk. that. That's eyes. a Zerbert. That's a Zerbert. <laughs> a raspberry is something different. <laughs> Bye, Chris. Bye. <laughs> and I don't want to be thinking about John Kasich while I'm doing that to my baby. <laughs> also today, in the shadow of Capitol Hill, a number of current and former Republican lawmakers met with GOP frontrunner Donald Trump to discuss policy and political strategy. My next guest was there. California Congressman Duncan Hunter is a Trump supporter and member of the House Armed Services Committee. Congressman, good to see you. So what was the purpose of this meeting? Hey, Megan, number one, he says hi and sends his, his uh, best wishes to you. He wanted to make sure I pass that on. I'm sure that's true. 
It's not true. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, here's, here's what it was. He, he was in town for the first time meeting with people that had supported him and have never met him. So that's, that's, that's kind of what this was. We didn't, you know, delve into any deep policy matters. It was substantive, but it, it wasn't crazy substantive. And we just talked. We, we heard from him. He talked politics. A, a few of us talked policy. And that was it. Did he listen? Because the, the, some of the critiques on Trump from even some of his top supporters is he needs to study. You know, if he would read some policy papers and so on, then when he goes out there at, at these debates or a general election debate, if he gets that far and so on, he could really impress on substance and not just style. He, he has time for that. And, and, you know, there was there was policy stuff and, and he he did listen because Trump is not a dumb guy. He would not be where he were, where he is if he was dumb. So, so he is smart and he knows what he does not know. And he knows that some people have the answers to that. There's guys like me that have, I did three, three tours. I've been doing, you know, foreign policy stuff and military stuff for seven years in, in Congress. I, I have advice for him. So he, he understands that he didn't do tours overseas, right? He, he, he's not going to act like, like, like he has, but he'll still take that and kind of put that into, into his own show, meaning he, he's going to in, internalize what we tell him and he's going to take that on the road. If you listen to his APAC speech, it was like listening to Mitt Romney. I mean, I, I, I was listening to it on the, uh, on, on the radio and it, it sounded like it, it was not the Mr. Trump from the last six months. It was a new Mr. Trump giving Wasn't a great speech. Wasn't he using speech, a teleprompter he, on that? Well, I don't, I don't know, but he did very well. Well, I'm just saying like, that the, the, this is what a lot of his supporters have been saying for months, that if he could be more disciplined, the teleprompter can help you out. It can help you organize your thoughts. I use it all the time, sure. right? Not sure. during interviews, but during the little scripts that get us from interview to interview. Um, and so it can sort of just help you stay disciplined and on message. So I'm in. I, we could all all learn more about everything, frankly. I, I don't think <laughs> he has had I don't think he has had to at this point. And I and I think he's very focused on simply winning. And, and I and I think once you win or at least get much much closer than we are now, like you guys just talked about, you're you're still covering election politics now. So, you know, he has, he has time for this. He, he's a, a very smart guy. He will pick it up very quickly. And he has surrounded himself with smart people. Great to see you, sir. Thank you. Joining me now with his take, Stuart Stevens, a former Mitt Romney campaign strategist and founding partner at Strategic Partners and Media. Stuart, thank you for being here. So what do you make? Are we now seeing, uh, you know, a more, a more disciplined, on-message Donald Trump as of today? Well, listen, I think those of us that have been critical of Donald Trump, um, for not listening and not uh, surrounding himself by uh, people who know more than him have to say it's a good thing when he does. So if he's with uh, smart people like the congressman and others and listening, I think that's a good thing and he should, uh, he, he should be congratulated for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, this what's amazing is that we are making a thing about a presidential candidate meeting with people who know policy and he's a front runner and you know it's sort of late in the race for this to be happening you know two other things happened today one one of sort of uh, uh of tactics and one of substance uh he said today that the united states should really probably get out of nato which is really sort of an extraordinary thing for uh any presidential candidate to say it just sort of to announce it but without any sort of uh, roll out or any sort of building a case for it. But at this time, when you have a ground war in Europe, when you have countries like Sweden is rearming, when you have this uh, resurgent uh, uh, Russia, I mean, Republicans uh, have a chance to really have a competitive advantage pointing out the problems with Hillary Clinton's worldview. This is a person that famously uh, wanted to reset relations with Russia. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we have a candidate who's out there saying, just sort of in an offhand way, well, you know, probably this NATO thing, we should maybe get out of NATO. Um, it's just not the way to convince people that you're serious about leading not only the country, but the world. What's the second thing? Second thing is when uh, Elizabeth Warren went out and uh, banged up Trump, and he came back and called her an Indian. She came out uh, with a tweet storm against him, calling him a loser. I, I, I would bet, right, and I would bet inside Elizabeth Warren's office they had some office pool that he would do that. 
Um, you just can't be baited like that that easily when you're a presidential candidate. It just takes you off message. And I mean, he's calling her an American Indian as if there's something wrong with being an American Indian. And it goes to this whole history of whether or not she claimed ethnicity to get into Harvard. But it's just this sort of, you know, kind of frat boy taunt, which is fine. I'm sure all this sort of in, you know, inner guys sort of loved it and thought it was great. Hey, you know, Mr. Trump, that's terrific. It's just not the way you broaden a base. And what's interesting is, you know, tonight we're talking about two states, Arizona and Utah. In the primary, Mitt Romney, he didn't have any trouble carrying both of these states, but then they are very different. He carried both of them uh, with big majorities in the primary. Well, wasn't he the only one effectively in the race by that point? I no, mean, he had, no. He had... You know, the last the last presidential debate was in uh, Arizona, um, and 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 there were there were uh, four or five candidates still in that race, um, including Speaker Gingrich. It was a uh, uh, very much still a race then, um, but look. Ultimately, you know, politics is about addition, not subtraction. Mm -hmm. That's something, when I came up with Haley Barber, it's something he always used to say. It's about adding more people, not taking away people. And that for Republicans to have any chance at all here, we have to take what Mitt Romney got, and we have to add to that. And there's different ways to do that. But basically, we can't lose any of the voters that we have and have any sort of fighting chance at all. Mm. And that's the business that the nominee needs to get about. Stuart, great to see you. Good to see you. In moments, Senator Ted Cruz will join the Kelly File to talk tomorrow's primary, his speech tonight on Israel, and new reports on a VP pick. Plus, between some crazy delegate math and some tough contests ahead, it looks increasingly like anything could happen at the Republican convention. And RNC Chairman Wrights Priebus is here to break down what he expects on the road ahead. Nobody is going to have enough delegates. We are going to go to a convention. It's going to be open. I'm very comfortable with uh, heading to that convention with momentum and more delegates. And we'll let the, uh, the people there make a choice. My leading Republican opponent has promised that he, as president, would be neutral between Israel and the Palestinians. Well, let me be very, very clear. As president, I will not be neutral. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have said they would maintain this Iranian deal. My view is very different. On the first day in office, I will rip this catastrophic Iranian nuclear deal to shreds. Well, that was Senator Ted Cruz less than two hours ago giving an impassioned speech at the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee conference. The Texas senator said just last week that he would use the speech to America's largest pro-Israel organization to draw distinctions between himself and GOP frontrunner Donald Trump. Joining me now, Republican senator from Texas and presidential candidate Ted Cruz. Senator, good to see you. So was that basically you, the Megan. distinction, you know, that Donald Trump has said he would be neutral in trying to negotiate a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and you don't believe neutrality is appropriate? Well, I think more than, than not being appropriate. Uh, anyone that, that can't tell the difference between our friends and allies, anyone that, that cannot distinguish between the state of Israel, which is fighting to defend its citizens from terrorism, and Islamic terrorists who are murdering women and children, who are murdering Israelis and murdering Americans, if you can't tell the difference between those, then that raises real questions about your fitness and judgment to be commander-in-chief. But here's what his defenders would say, that he's talking yeah. about a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians, not necessarily Hamas, which we've dubbed a terrorist group, but mm -hmm. if we really want to achieve peace, how, how can mm -hmm. you do it? This is what his defenders would say. How can you do it going in there already having chosen a side? Well, for one thing, the Palestinian Authority is, is in what they call a unity government with Hamas. Hamas is part of the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas mm -hmm. is a terrorist organization that celebrates the murder of innocent civilians. You know, j just a few days ago, Taylor Force, an American, a Texan, an Eagle Scout, a West Point graduate, an Army veteran, was murdered by a Palestinian terrorist, and the Palestinian Authority celebrated, cheered, they incite this violence, and they actually pay compensation to the families of the terrorists who commit these crimes. And, and what Donald's comments about neutrality reflect is that he buys into the typical media narrative and the view of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, that there is somehow a moral equivalency between Israel and the terrorists. The barrier to peace is not Israel. 
Israel wants peace. The barrier to peace is the Palestinian Authority that refuses to acknowledge Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state and that continues to support terrorism. And if, if we're going to see peace, I would love to see peace in the Middle East. The only way to do it is not with a president treating the terrorists as if they're standing on the same level as the IDF forces fighting to keep people safe, but rather to have America stand unapologetically with Israel. And America can help broker a deal. But our allegiance between our allies and our enemies should not be confused. And Donald Trump mm -hmm. has demonstrated no understanding of that. You know, I would note also, Megan, another major foreign policy area that, that, that Donald's knowledge is, is badly deficient is the Iranian nuclear deal. Both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have said they would maintain this nuclear deal. Now, Donald has said he would renegotiate it. He right. would come in and negotiate a better deal. Listen, anyone who says that doesn't understand the Ayatollah Khamenei who pledges death to America. There's mm -hmm. not a better deal with Khamenei. The mm -hmm. only thing Khamenei understands is strength instead of weakness and appeasement. And, and, and Donald Trump has not demonstrated that he understands okay. the nature of Islamic terrorists. Let me ask you uh, a question about 2016 because a report broke today yeah. that you and your campaign were or are considering a unity ticket with Marco Rubio and, and actually did some polling on it and looked into it that, that so far Rubio hasn't been interested in that but that would, that, that would definitely be news to a lot of Republicans and, and would be good news to certainly Rubio supporters. Is it true? Uh, listen, I, I uh, read that and kind of shook my head in wonderment. It's amazing the things that reporters will write. I have not had any conversations uh, with Marco about that. My team hasn't had any conversations with his team about that. I think the world of Marco Rubio, I think he's very, very talented. He's a wonderful communicator. He really can, can tell his story and, 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 and weave the tapestry, paint the picture of the American dream powerfully. And I'll tell you, Megan, what we're seeing is the overwhelming majority of Rubio supporters are coming to support our campaign. And would I would, rule it out? we enthusiastically welcome them. And, and, and I would enthusiastically welcome Marco's support. I, I think he would add a great deal uh, to our team, and I, and I hope he does choose to, to, to support us. But would you rule out the unity ticket in particular? His support, of course you want that. Uh, listen, I absolutely want his support. I want the support of John Kasich. We are seeing... Yeah, but you're dodging. You know, well, you're dodging. Uh, Come on, tell me the truth. What's the deal? Would you consider a unity the, 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 ticket The truth is I've had no conversations with him about that. I, I, I think any Republican would naturally have Marco on their short list, and you would look seriously to, to him as a vice presidential choice. I haven't had that conversation with him, but I would certainly welcome his support. Got it. And I think he would add an enormous amount to the team. Need a, need a quick prediction on what's going to happen tomorrow in Utah and Arizona yeah. before I let you go. You know, I think tomorrow's going to be a very, very good day. In Utah, I'm exceedingly optimistic. We, we have the support. Uh, Mitt Romney announced that he's going to be voting for me tomorrow in Utah. He encouraged people in Utah and across the country to vote for Ted. He said Ted is the only one who can beat Donald Trump. And Mitt went on to say a vote for John Kasich is a vote for Donald Trump. It's just a spoiler vote. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got the support of Senator Mike Lee and also Governor Gary Herbert, the governor in Utah. So I think we're going to do very well in Utah. Arizona? I'm encouraged, but Arizona is very competitive. Donald Trump has a lead in the early vote, and a pretty significant lead. We are surging and we're ahead on election day. And so what, what happens in Arizona is gonna come down to turnout. If there's a big, big turnout tomorrow, then the election day vote could overcome Donald's lead in early vote, but it really depends on conservatives coming together and, you know, we've got a lot of strong conservatives in Arizona supporting us, including uh, Congressman Matt Salmon and Trent Franks and Paul Gosard. So I'm very encouraged that the strong conservatives are unifying Got it. and that we're seeing the whole range of the Republican Party coming together behind our campaign because we are the only campaign that has beaten Donald Trump over and over and over again nine times. And we're the only campaign that can and will beat Donald okay. and then critically go on to beat Hillary Clinton and win the general election. Senator Ted Cruz, always great speaking with you. Thanks for being here. Th thank you, Megan. And, and don't forget to come to TedCruz.org and support us. I know you don't, you don't mean me. <laughs> I, no, no, I would love, love your support, Megan. If you I, maxed busy. out, we could make news. You know, you're, you're a big fancy TV person. You can afford to max out. <laughs> Never made a political donation in my life. Not looking to start. Great to see you, though. Great to see you, Megan. Well, when a Frank Lund's focus group was recently asked to evaluate Hillary Clinton, their reaction was remarkable, and we have it for you tonight. Plus, a Donald Trump supporter this weekend attacked a protester at a campaign rally. And tonight, Judge Andrew Napolitano is here on the complaints that these protesters are there to intentionally start trouble. I had a sign that said, 
Trump is bad for America. The guy grabbed the sign out of my hand as I was being escorted out of the building and sucker punched me. Trump's foreign policy team may be making news tonight, but one of the big stories this weekend was the latest outburst of violence at a Trump rally. Again, a Trump supporter was caught on camera attacking a protester. Watch this. Trace Gallagher, live in our West Coast newsroom with more on this. Trace? Megan, in the first seven minutes of the Trump rally in Tucson, three different sets of protesters were ejected. At first, Trump made light of it, saying, we love our protesters. When security kicked out the second group, Trump ignored it. But then came the third set, a woman wearing a Ku Klux Klan hood and a man wearing an American flag shirt carrying a picture of Trump's face covered by a Confederate flag. Trump said they were disgusting and told security to get them out. That's when Air Force Staff Sergeant Tony Petway attacked. Watch again. And while the crowd chanted USA, Airman Petway was arrested. The man who got repeatedly punched and kicked was led outside and told a local TV station that he attended the Bernie Sanders rally the night before and nobody got punched. Listen to him. You got this, which is fascism and an angry mob. And then you got what happened last night with Bernie. And that's democracy right there. But Donald Trump later indicated the protesters came looking for trouble. Watch. He happened to be African-American, the person who was a supporter. And it was a shame uh, what happened. But you know what? He saw a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and you people don't write that. And in fairness, there were agitators taunting Trump supporters with foul language, shutting down a highway, causing a huge traffic jam, forcing some Trump supporters to walk for miles to actually get to the rally. Megan. Trace, thank you. Well, as Trace mentioned, we're hearing complaints that these protesters are going to the rallies looking to start trouble. So where do you draw the legal line here? Judge Andrew Napolitano is our Fox News senior judicial analyst and a New York Times bestselling author. So Trump is, is, is suggesting that the guy punched the protester because he got upset because he saw somebody in the KKK. That's what Donald Trump suggested. But the law is if you want to wear a KKK outfit at any rally to protest your view of the speaker, and that's all you're doing is wearing it, perhaps walking around with it. You're not shouting the speaker down. You're not throwing punches. You're not throwing chairs. You're not preventing the speaker from using the room for which he rented it. Mm -hmm. That itself is protected speech, as much protected as the speech so that the, the speaker's giving. So the woman we've seen there wearing the KKK hat, she's not the one getting beaten down, but she's right behind him. She's got a KKK hat on. Th that... that that, that is protected that speech. That is protected speech. As is the but guy. But he's not who, beating the woman with the hat. He's beating a guy that wore an American flag as sort of a half bandana, half shirt. For what reason he's beating that guy, who knows? But that is protected speech as well. In fact, this is a Supreme Court p opinion right on point that any twisted, tormented version of the flag is protected speech. So, um, so that's w the, the legality of the shirt and the hats and all that. People are trying to pin this on Trump because he has used language right. that would, I mean, he's directly said, you know, punch him in the face right. and I'll pay your legal fees. Right. In he the old days, they would carry him out fees. on a stretcher. Right. He said he was considering paying the legal fees of the, the guy who punched the uh, protester right in the face last week or two weeks ago. So to what extent can this be attributed to Donald Trump legally? Very little, if at all. You, you may argue he's created an atmosphere and there's going to be a political reaction to that. That's a political argument. But legally, if he says, there he is, get him, and the crowd descends immediately. That's there's, a different story. That's a different story. But if he says, there he is, get him, and uh, an hour later or a half an hour later, even five minutes later, or at another rally, they pounce on a similarly situated person. Yeah. Trump's speech is protected. That's not good enough. We're all responsible for our own conduct. So with respect to the people who are doing the punching, and hello, stop doing that. <laughs> they are responsible. They're, they're going down. Let me tell you who else is responsible. The police. The police should not kick somebody out 
because Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton or Ted Cruz says to kick them out. Mm -hmm. Because, again, unless they are materially interfering with the speech. If they're disrupting, if they're materially disrupting. Then they can be kicked out. But if they are just displaying some emblem, something as hateful as a KKK, something as twisted as a torn up uh, flag, something as direct as a, as a, as a T-shirt, that's protected speech. And the police have to protect the right of the speaker to speak, the right of the listeners to hear, and the right of the protesters to protest. They have to find that fine line that protects all of them. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. The disruption has to be very big. In a school, even, a school can't throw out a student unless it can be shown there's a significant disruption to the class. And so in a, ra a presidential rally, the standard would be even more forgiving of the protester. Judge, it's great to see you as always. Good to be here, Megan. Enjoy your vacation. Thank you very much. Going to the happiest place on earth. Yes, What's it not is. To like? Your kids will love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right here? <laughs> That's terrible news. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> that is bad news. <laughs> also tonight, between some crazy delegate math and some tough contests ahead, it looks like anything could happen at the Republican convention this summer. And the RNC chair is here next to tell us what he expects on the road ahead. Are they going to change the rules? Stay tuned. It's the Kelly File with Megan Kelly. Welcome back to the Kelly File. Less than 12 hours until the polls open in the next big primaries, Arizona and Utah. And today, Donald Trump for the, for the first time revealed his foreign policy team. Mr. Trump listing the names of five people uh, who are counseling him. Some of them may be known to you, including Walid Fares, a Fox News Mideast expert and advisor to Congress on terrorism, among others. You can see Senator Jeff Sessions there as well. Joining me now, Stephen Miller, who's a senior advisor to the Trump campaign and former advisor to Republican Senator Jeff Sessions, and Mark Thiessen, who's a Fox News contributor and former chief speechwriter to President George W. Bush. Great to see you both. So, Good Mark, to see you, Megan. Your, your thoughts on um, what we heard from Trump today at APAC and this foreign policy team he's now uh, announcing. Yeah, so we heard today uh, the scripted Donald Trump and the unscripted Donald Trump. At AIPAC, we heard the scripted Donald Trump, and it was pretty good. Uh, he knows how to do This is the first time he's ever delivered a prepared speech, and he did a pretty good job. He hit all the grace notes, though there were some things in there that were surprising. He said both that he would in, he would scrap the Iran deal and also enforce it, which is kind of in, incoherent. Uh, but then we heard the unscripted Donald Trump at the Washington Post, and it was an absolute disaster. Is he uh, sat he down and he, had a meeting with their editorial board today? He, he had a meeting with the editorial board, and it, it was sort of a stream of consciousness Donald Trump uh, in this open meeting, and it was a debacle. I mean, he said that we are, that we, our military bases in Asia, they, had, they don't do, serve any purpose for us whatsoever. Uh, he said that NATO uh, it was an alliance for an earlier time, and that we, that we spend hundreds of billions of dollars on NATO, which is factually incorrect. We do not spend hundreds of billions of dollars on NATO, and that we can't afford it anymore. And he basically said, we can't afford to lead the world anymore. So at APAC, he says, we're going to lead a global coalition to dismantle Iran's terror network, but at the Washington Post, he says, we are a poor and debtor nation and we can't afford to lead anymore. Those are inco in incompatible things. So Donald Trump unscripted is very different and much scarier than Donald Trump when he's reading a speech. What of that, Stephen? What about Mark's claims in particular on, on um, you know, what he said in terms of the money that we spend on NATO? Hey, great to be here tonight. Uh, well, Mark, I hope you feel better now that you've gotten all that off your chest. Um, <laughs> the... In, uh, it's funny, Mark's complaining about um, or talking about the scripted remarks tonight, but I heard Mark practicing his speech in the green room, and it was identical to what he just said to you. So I guess Mark likes scripted remarks, too. But I don't really know where to begin with what... Let's keep it a little higher brow than that, Stephen. Really? That's <laughs> the best you can do, Stephen? I can do better. Really? Here's one Seriously? for you. Here's, here's Here. one for you. Okay? Yeah. The, you're talking about NATO. I have a question for you, Mark. If there's a, war, there's a war guarantee in NATO, if Russia incurs on Ukraine's borders, would you send American troops to fight and die in Ukraine? I suspect the answer to that question can, is can, no. Before we put well, Mark on, uh, before we and put then, Mark and on the microscope, because he's not yet running for president, maybe someday. <laughs> right. But could you just right. respond, then, Stephen, to, to respond right. to Mark's claims about yeah, I know, what I Trump said well, on, on NATO yeah. and, the, and the, he says right. that he's so factually just getting, inaccurate just, right. in his claims about what we spend just, on NATO. Right. I was just getting through that. The, the reality is, is that NATO is an organization made many decades ago that is incongruent with our current foreign policy challenges with respect to Iran and dismantling Iran's global terror networks. That can be accomplished with economic sanctions, not with costly nation building that Mark has supported throughout his career that has drained our <laughs> blood and treasure and made us less safe. Yeah. And so this is a major choice in this election. And so what I'm saying tonight to voters as the representative of the Trump campaign is, if you want more foreign wars, 
If you want to lose more soldiers, more blood, and more treasure fighting and dying overseas in one country after another country after another country, then you can follow the path that other candidates have laid out okay. and that Mark supports. Yeah. But we're talking okay. about defending the it. core can interests of the respond, United States. Let him respond. Go. It, it, I, it sounds yeah. like, you know, so this sounds a lot like Rand Paul. We've heard this same Absolutely. sort of line, which was very popular with some voto voters, Mark. Yeah, I think that's unfair, Megan, because actually Donald Trump makes Rand Paul look like a neocon. I mean, that's the problem with Rand Paul's foreign policy. And we just saw in Stephen's answer to you the incompetence when it comes to foreign policy of the Trump operation, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO, so there is no Article 5 commitment. No, but I was, so apparently I you was and Donald Trump don't know that. I was you asking you, 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 <laughs> don't, I was was asking you about the effort. No, I was asking you about the long-standing effort to get Ukraine, to get Georgia, to Stop get that. other Eastern Bloc countries Stand to down. join NATO. There is an effort All to right. expand Stephen, NATO. Stephen, I'm going to have to get rid of you if you don't stop talking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, my job is to maintain order. That's it. Okay. I'm going to let Mark speak, and then I'm going to let you speak again, Stephen. Let him speak yeah. un uninterrupted, so please. Go ahead, Mark. So what, Don what Donald Trump laid out today in his Washington Post interview was a foreign policy that basically comes to this. Withdraw from the world so we can focus on nation building here at home, pull back from our allies in Europe and Asia, and, and, so, and embrace people like Vladimir Putin, and, and we basically uh, if let Europe lead, and we lead from behind. That is the Obama foreign policy. And Stephen, here's a question for you. Let's play a little game called, who said it, Donald Trump or, or Barack Obama? Here's a quote. Over the last decade, we have spent a trillion dollars on war at a time of rising debt and hard economic times. It's time to focus on nation building here at home. Well, we all know that President Obama is talking about nation building here at home. The problem is he hasn't done that because he's left our border wide open. He sent all of our manufacturing jobs overseas, and he's hollowed out the middle class, an agenda you support also, Mark. And the point that I was making with NATO is that there has been an effort to get Eastern Bloc countries to join NATO as part of the effort to try and push back Putin that would put the United States in a position of offering war guarantees to countries that we're not going to fight and die for. And this has been a major debate, and you know that. Okay. And with respect to his speech today at APAC, we gotta go, and this so is quickly. important, he laid out a plan to sanction Iran, to dismantle their terror networks, to protect our vital economic interests. And that combined with bringing back our manufacturing jobs, protecting okay. our border, and protecting American workers I'm, will revitalize our middle class okay, and say stark right. contrast okay. to the go. globalism of Mark and his donors. No more. It's over. <laughs> I don't know how this got so his mean. His donor friends. We, we don't like mean here in the Kelly Files. Let's be friendly. Yeah, I thought it was fun debate. and great. I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> I don't think you guys like each other. It's great to see you, nonetheless. Coming up, Trump's foreign policy team may be making news tonight, but one of the big stories this weekend was the latest outburst of violence at a Trump rally. Again, a Trump supporter was caught on camera attacking a protester. Watch this. Trace Gallagher, live in our West Coast newsroom with more on this. Trace? Megan, in the first seven minutes of the Trump rally in Tucson, three different sets of protesters were ejected. At first, Trump made light of it, saying, we love our protesters. When security kicked out the second group, Trump ignored it. But then came the third set, a woman wearing a Ku Klux Klan hood and a man wearing an American flag shirt carrying a picture of Trump's face covered by a Confederate flag. Trump said they were disgusting and told security to get them out. That's when Air Force Staff Sergeant Tony Petway attacked. Watch again. And while the crowd chanted USA, Airman Petway was arrested. The man who got repeatedly punched and kicked was led outside and told a local TV station that he attended the Bernie Sanders rally the night before and nobody got punched. Listen to him. You got this, which is fascism and an angry mob. And then you got what happened last night with Bernie. And that's democracy right there. But Donald Trump later indicated the protesters came looking for trouble. Watch. He happened to be African-American, the person who was a supporter. And it was a shame uh, what happened. But you know what? He saw a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And you people don't write that. And in fairness, there were agitators taunting Trump supporters with foul language, shutting down a highway, causing a huge traffic jam, forcing some Trump supporters to walk for miles to actually get to the rally.
Megan. Trace, thank you. Well, as Trace mentioned, we're hearing complaints that these protesters are going to the rallies looking to start trouble. So where do you draw the legal line here? Judge Andrew Napolitano is our Fox News senior judicial analyst and a New York Times bestselling author. So Trump is, is, is suggesting that the guy punched the protester because he got upset because he saw somebody in the KKK. That's what Donald Trump suggested. But the law is, if you want to wear a KKK outfit at any rally to protest your view of the speaker, and that's all you're doing is wearing it, perhaps walking around with it, you're not shouting the speaker down, you're not throwing punches, you're not throwing chairs, you're not preventing the speaker from using the room for which he rented it. Mm -hmm. That itself is protected speech, as much protected as the speech so that the, the speaker's giving. So the woman we've seen there wearing the KKK hat, she's not the one getting beaten down, but she's right behind him. She's got a KKK hat on. Th that... that that, that is protected that speech. That is protected speech. As is the but guy. But he's not who, beating the woman with the hat. He's beating a guy that wore an American flag as sort of a half bandana, half shirt. For what reason he's beating that guy, who knows? But that is protected speech as well. In fact, there's a Supreme Court p opinion right on point that any twisted, tormented version of the flag is protected speech. So, um, so that's w the, the legality of the shirt and the hats and all that. People are trying to pin this on Trump because he has used language right. that would, I mean, he's directly said, you know, punch him in the face right. and I'll pay your legal fees. Right. In he the old days, they would carry him out fees. on a stretcher. Right. He said he was considering paying the legal fees of the, the guy who punched the uh, protester right in the face last week or two weeks ago. So to what extent can this be attributed to Donald Trump legally? Very little, if at all. You, you may argue he's created an atmosphere and there's going to be a political reaction to that. That's a political argument. But legally, if he says, there he is, get him, and the crowd descends immediately. That's there's, a different story. That's a different story. But if he says, there he is, get him, and uh, an hour later or a half an hour later, even five minutes later, or at another rally, they pounce on a similarly situated person. Yeah. Trump's speech is protected. That's not good enough. We're all responsible for our own conduct. So with respect to the people who are doing the punching, and hello, stop doing that. <laughs> they are responsible. They're, they're going down. Let me tell you who else is responsible. The police. The police should not kick somebody out because Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton or Ted Cruz says to kick them out. Mm -hmm. Because, again, unless they are materially interfering with That's the right. speech. If they're disrupting, if they're materially disrupting. Then they can story. be kicked out. But if they are just displaying some emblem, something as hateful as a KKK, something as twisted as a torn up uh, flag, something as direct as a, as a, as a T-shirt, that's protected speech. And the police have to protect the right of the speaker to speak, the right of the listeners to hear, and the right of the protesters to protest. They have to find that fine line that protects all of them. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. The disruption has to be very big. In a school, even, a school can't throw out a student unless it can be shown there's a significant disruption to the class. And so in a, ra a presidential rally, the standard would be even more forgiving of the protester. Judge, it's great to see you as always. Good to be here, Megan. Enjoy your vacation. Thank you very much. Going to the happiest place on earth. Yes, What's it is. To like? Kids will love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right here? That's <laughs> terrible news. You can hear that from me. <laughs> that is bad news. <laughs>